Good afternoon. Today we have the honor and privilege of having Ambassador KP Fabian with us. Ambassador Fabian will talk on conflicts, international and national. Ambassador KP Fabian served in the Indian Foreign Service from 1964 to 2000. He was ambassador of India to Finland, Qatar, and Italy. Post retirement, Ambassador Fabian has been active with NGOs, corporate bodies, and academia. He is currently a professor at Symbiosis University and the Indian Society of International Law. He is on the guest faculty of Geneva Faculty of Diplomacy and International Relations. He has published the following book, Common Sense on Iraq War and Diplomacy Indian Style. His latest book, The Arab Spring that was and wasn't is due shortly. You're welcome, Ambassador Fabian. Um, we, you have uh, uh, till five o'clock for your session, so you can conduct it however you like to, sir. Over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, dear Secretary General and uh, dear friends in uh, Delhi, elsewhere in India, and uh, elsewhere. So, I'm so glad to be with all of you. It's a privilege. Now, today is the 30th of January. Now, on this day, in the year 1948, the Apostle of Peace, Mohandas Karanjan Gandhi, was killed by a fellow human being, Nathuram Gotse, who honestly believed that he was doing the right thing. Now, no man in history has done more for conflict resolution through dialogue than Gandhi. Now, let's raise a question. Does India, including official India, care for Gandhi or his message of peace and nonviolence his message of fearlessness and uncompromising fight for justice, his message of caring the utmost for the weakest. There has been a move, there has been a move gathering momentum to exalt Godse by building a temple for him to adore, to adore him. May we see the picture, please? A temple for Nathuram Gotse, Hindu Mahasabha lays foundation stone in Golier office. This uh, was, uh, you know, in 2017. What happened was that they couldn't get permission uh, for uh, building a temple. So they had a statue made and garlanded it in the office. Now, another, you know, um, move to honor Godse in Madhya Pradesh. Next picture, please. Now, there is a lot of, uh, you know, what shall I say, controversy about all this. Now, what is a dialogue? Dialogue means conversation between two or among more. Conversation can be serious. Maybe, maybe we can remove that picture now. Conversation can be serious and sincere. It can also be spurious and insincere. Question. Several rounds of talks have taken place between the farmers and the government of India. Now these talks, have they been serious and sincere or have they been so far spurious and insincere? Well, there are examples of uh, serious talks and spurious talks across the world and in history too. Let us now look at uh, one or two examples of successful conflict resolution. The 1962 
Cuban Missile Crisis. The media reported eyeball to eyeball confrontation. The young president of the United States, John F. Kennedy, 44, showed statementship of high order. He did not provoke a confrontation. He made Nikita Khrushchev, 68, surrender. Now, at this point, I want to tell you a story about uh, which I picked up. I don't know, it is apocryphal. It may or may not be true, but uh, which I picked up in Vienna way back uh, in 1971, 72. That is 10 years after the historic meeting between the two cases, that is Khrushchev and Kennedy. Next picture, please. Sir. What uh, I was told was that uh, uh, thank you for the picture. What I was told, I mean, uh, let's, yeah, that one, please keep it. What I was told was that uh, Kennedy was totally unprepared for uh, this uh, in, uh, meeting at the summit level. The Bay of Pigs, about which we shall talk more, a disastrous CIA project to invade and uh, topple Fidel Castro had miserably failed in April 1961. A few weeks later, Kennedy went to Vienna to meet with Khrushchev. At one evening, they decided to have dinner together without any interpreter, just the two of them. And they started boasting. Kennedy said that uh, in the United States, they could bring a dead man back to life. Medical science is so advanced. Khrushchev said that, well, we can do that. But do you have people who can run at 500 kilometers an hour? At that point, the bearer came with some wine. Actually, it was a young foreign service official from the Austrian foreign office because uh, they had taken over the management of the restaurant. So the young uh, bearer poured out the wine and then both these leaders looked at him and said, we have a problem, can you resolve it, please? So he said, please, tell me the problem. So they said that, look, uh, one of us is saying that uh, uh, he can, uh, his uh, country can bring dead people back to life. And the other is saying that uh, uh, he has uh, athletes uh, who can run at 500 kilometers uh, an hour. So the bearer poured some more wine and said, okay, there is a solution. If President Kennedy can bring Stalin back to life, then Prime Minister Khrushchev will run not 500 kilometers an hour, but even a thousand kilometers an hour. So that settled that, okay. To go back about uh, what happened in 1962. It's always important to get the timeline in such matters. Now, where do we find a good timeline? Let us check with the BBC. Events of the Cuban Missile Crisis, 1962. 14th October, an American U-2 spy plane discovered Soviet nuclear missiles on Cuba. Missile launch sites were being constructed. 16th October, President Kennedy was informed of missiles on Cuba. Kennedy called a meeting of his advisors. That was called XCOM. Eh? And XCOM was asked 
tasked with deciding what action to take. The options included invasion of Cuba, blockade of Cuba to stop, stop more deliveries from the Soviet Union, airstrikes against the missile bases, and the last, no action. On the option of talks with the Soviet Union, well, some members wanted it, others opposed it. Then 22nd of October, I'm reading the BBC timeline, Kennedy decided to blockade Cuba and American forces were put on high alert. Kennedy addressed the American public and the world on television. He announced that there were Soviet missiles on Cuba and that the USA was blockading the island. Next picture, please. Well, this is my comment. The word blockade was not used. Kennedy used the word quarantine. Why? Because blockade is an act of war and he didn't want to use that. But effect is the same. Anyway, 24th October, Soviet ships turned around before reaching the blockade. BBC language, huh? Okay. <clears throat> 26 October, Khrushchev sent Kennedy his first letter promising to remove missiles on Cuba if the blockade was lifted. Again, wrong, because what Khrushchev wanted was not only the lifting of quarantine or blockade or whatever you call it, but also an assurance from Kennedy that America will not, I repeat, will not invade Cuba. 27th October, before a response could be made, Khrushchev sent a second letter. He made the additional demand that American missiles in Turkey were to be removed. 28th October, Kennedy accepted the first letter. Attorney General Robert Kennedy, eh, John Kennedy's brother, discussed how to settle the crisis with Soviet Ambassador Anatoly Dobrini. <laughs> he promised that the USA, he meaning <clears throat> Robert, would remove missiles from Turkey. However, this was banned from being announced to the public at this time. Now, my comment, this is incomplete narration because what happened was that Dobrinin and Robert Kennedy discussed the matter. Then Dobrinin came back with a letter addressed to Kennedy, that is Robert Kennedy, summarizing their conversation and mentioning there that, uh, uh, you know, the missiles, actually Jupiter missiles from Turkey would be removed. <clears throat> Kennedy read the letter and then he begged Dobrinin to take it back. That is what's happened. Now, BBC speaks about the impact on international relations. Uh, let me sort of save time by summarizing it. Uh, a hotline was created in 63. Then uh, <clears throat> we had the test ban treaty. Good, summing up by the BBC, except it misses out something very important. In 1962, 20th of October, China invaded India. Actually, Mao Zedong was looking very carefully at the geopolitical scene. And he reckoned that the missile crisis in Cuba was the best timing for him to invade India. Now, I have another comment, and that is, to my mind, Khrushchev showed statementship in accepting the request to keep mum about the Jupiter missiles. Now, let's go to Encyclopedia Britannica. I'm sorry to say, hardly better than the BBC. The starting sentence, having promised in May 1960 to defend Cuba with Soviet arms, the Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev assumed that the United States would take, would take no steps to prevent the installation of Soviet medium and intermediate range ballistic missiles in Cuba. Such missiles 
could hit much of the eastern United States within a few minutes if launched from Cuba. Two comments from me. One, no explanation of the background to the promise made by Khrushchev in May 1960. Second comment implies that the presence of the missiles significantly in Cuba significantly added to the nuclear threat from the Soviet Union. Now, the second comment is absolutely wrong, and I'll tell you why. Kennedy himself said on 22nd October <coughs> to his ex-com that uh, it doesn't make any difference if you get blown up by an ICBM flying from the Soviet Union or one that was 90 miles away. Geography doesn't mean that much. And uh, McNamara, he had said at the XCOM, let me be very frank, this is not a military problem. This is not a security matter. This is a political problem. Why political? Because Kennedy got elected on the basis of a lie. The lie was that there was a missile gap between the Soviet Union and the United States under the watch of Eisenhower. Now, that was a lie. Why do I say that? Because at that time, the Soviets had 36 ICBMs, okay? And the United States had 203 ICBMs, eh? 138, uh, sorry, 36 and 203. The Soviets had 138 long-range bombers with 392 nuclear warheads. United States had 1,306 long-range bombers with 3,104 nuclear warheads. The Soviets had 72 SLBMs, submarine launch ballistic missile warheads. Well, United States had double of that, 144. All told, according to experts, the Soviet uh, America had nine times as many uh, nuclear weapons as uh, the Soviet Union. So there was no missile gap. Now, second, another point I want to make is that there has been unusual praise for Robert Kennedy. You know, saying that he kept a cool head and he talked to Anatoly Dobrynin and brought in a resolution. But uh, Sheldon M. Stern, who has read up all these files, he says that uh, in his book, eh? Sheldon uh, has written the book 13 days. In fact, he, I mean, uh, Robert, was among the most consistently and recklessly hawkish of the president's advisors, pushing not for a blockade or even airstrikes against Cuba, but for a full scale invasion as the last chance we will have to destroy Castro. In fact, Stern continues, if RFK, Robert Kennedy, had been president and the views he expressed during the XCOM meetings had prevailed, nuclear war would have been the nearly certain outcome. Well, Kennedy also has been placed, but that praise again is misplaced. Now, just to go back for a second to the historical background, we spoke of the Bay of Pigs, April 1961, which was a disaster, but they didn't stop there. They started Operation Mongoose immediately after the failure of the Bay of Pigs. Now, in 2000 C, CIA documents were released 
the title given was fam given was family jewels there was a church committee looking into cia's assassination operations now the cia official told the committee that there were eight attempts on castro's life from 1960 to 1965 a cuban intelligence official fabian escalant not a relation of mine eh, said that there were 300 638 attempts cigars with uh, botulinum toxin ball point hypodermic in uh, panama uh, uh, castro was addressing a meeting 90 kilograms of explosives were stored under the podium they even tried with his mistress who tried to poison him so castro said if escaping assassination were considered one of the olympic games then he should get a gold medal so what is the lesson the lesson is history is more complicated than physics if you want to know about the relativity theory well you can read one or with reading two books you will get it but if you want to know about the french revolution even if you read 50 books or even 100 books you will still need to read more now this reminds me of august comte who had uh, postulated the hierarchy of sciences you know in the ascending order mathematics astronomy physics chemistry biology and sociology for him sociology was the queen of the sciences well i want to make a comment how about inserting psychology after biology now let's move on let us look at another instance where a third party assistance was given but not taken the korean war june 1950 north korea invaded south korea by october 1950 <clears throat> initially the south korean forces retreated but later macarthur general macarthur came into the scene and the so called un forces actually you know it was um, a coalition but led by america macarthur um, they were advancing north towards the chinese border they were going to advance now sometime in early october 1950 the indian ambassador sardar came panikur in uh, beijing i think they used to call it peking at that time um, was summoned to the foreign office by the prime minister chuan lai at midnight chuan lai wanted nehru to inform truman that if macarthur's forces do not stop the pla people's liberation army would uh, enter the field truman dismissed nehru macarthur told truman oh the boys will be home by christmas time christmas 1950 eh? well 3 years and 5 million deaths later including 37000 american deaths later <coughs> what happened <clears throat> the <clears throat> ceasefire line was on the same 38th parallel which nehru had proposed i mean which was the parallel uh, line uh, uh, border line between north and south korea and was slightly adjusted to the advantage of north korea <clears throat> okay now <clears throat> let's look at the league of nations you know it has been maligned much next picture please it was established <coughs> after world war 1 which was called the war to end all wars 
Well, look at that picture, Island, Island Islands. I've been there when I was posted to Finland. Very briefly, the background was that, you see, Finland was under Sweden, but uh, in 1809, during the Napoleonic, uh, Napoleonic Wars, uh, Sweden had to surrender Finland to Russia. Then, <clears throat> so Russia got both Finland and also the Island Islands. And then in 1918, <clears throat> Finland declared independence and Holland Islands was under it. And at that time, in the Holland Islands, uh, most of the uh, islanders were, were Swedish speaking. <clears throat> they wanted uh, to join uh, Sweden because there was also a civil war going on in Finland uh, because uh, one side wanted a communist government. Well, then, uh, the matter hotted up. In Sweden also, some people wanted to annex uh, Ireland, islands. The matter went to the League of Nations, or rather Paris and London decided to take it to the League of Nations. But even before that, uh, the Paris Treaty, you know, uh, was going on. You know, the um, Versailles Treaty, which ended the First World War. But nothing could be decided uh, during the peace talks, then later it went to the League of Nations, the League examined it, and the League said that uh, Finland's sovereignty cannot be contested, but uh, uh, the islands uh, should be demilitarized because there was a, an agreement to that effect during the Crimean War of 1856 um, and all that. Well, <clears throat> Then they wanted uh, three experts uh, to sort of make recommendations after studying it. Well, both Paris and London decided not to uh, nominate anyone because uh, the matter was uh, so complicated. Finally, an American and two others they got and uh, there was a recommendation which was accepted in the league and which is accepted by both Finland and Sweden. Now there is absolute peace that prevails in Holland Islands because they can go to Sweden whenever they want. They can work there. In fact, most of them work in Sweden, a good many of them when I was there and there is no problem at all. So the matter got resolved. Actually, uh, Treaty Series 1922, number six, Convention Respecting the Non-Fortification and Neutralization of the Holland Islands, signed at Geneva, October 20, 1921. Ratification exchanged at Geneva, April 6, 1922. Okay. Next one was Upper Silesia. This was between uh, <coughs> uh, Poland and uh, Germany. Again, this was resolved by the League. Next is Mosul. Mosul in uh, Iraq. Uh, well, talking about Mosul, you know, for a long time, the Europeans believed that muslin came from Mosul, etymologically. Well, etymologically, the word might have come from Mosul, but in the actual world, Muslim, Muslim came from what is now Bangladesh. Okay, so Mosul, the, uh, the controversy or the dispute was between uh, Iraq and uh, Turkey. The league intervened and uh, Mosul was given to Iraq and Turkey had to accept it. Now, next picture, please. Now, can you identify the four men there? Well, <clears throat> you have there uh, on the left, uh, Lloyd George Britain, slightly shorter than him, 
is Orlando, Italy. Then comes with the bow tie, <coughs> Clemenceau of France. And the tallest is, of course, uh, Wilson, Woodrow Wilson. Now, these were the four big men. Now, the League failed to act on Italy's invasion of Ethiopia. It failed to act on Japan's invasion of China. And the Second World was started. Now, who is to blame? The League or the great powers? To my mind, the great powers are to be blamed. Because the League only provided a forum. League is not an independent actor. And the same comment can be made about the United Nations. <clears throat> now, the UN Charter. It was basically drafted in the State Department. At some point, UK contributed, a little less Soviet Union, and uh, China, China under Chiang Kai-shek, also contributed, but much less. Now, Roosevelt had this idea of having four policemen to keep peace in the global village. So he nominated uh, USA, USSR, UK, and China to be the four policemen. Churchill didn't like China being there. He thought, you know, having an Asiatic power was an insult to Europeans, but Churchill wanted to have a bargain. He told Roosevelt, I don't like China being there, but I will agree if you take France in. Well, at that time, France was getting liberated. Eh? Anyway, Roosevelt agreed. That's how France got in. Stalin was scandalized that a Asiatic power should sit in judgment over us Europeans. But he also agreed but he got something else in return. That is the veto power. <laughs> so, <clears throat> it is the Security Council which is charged with the responsibility to maintain peace and security. But to my mind, it has failed more often than not. As we know, the Korean War, the Indochina War, well, nothing much was done by the Security Council. Now, I want to talk to you about a man called V.K. Krishnamenon. Next picture, please. Here is a superb example of dialogue. <coughs> Sorry. V.K. Krishnamenon was, uh, you know, the MI5, the British secret intelligence. Um, the MI5 had uh, uh, seriously thought of uh, assassinating Krishnamenon because uh, he was supposed to be coming to uh, Delhi as a cabinet minister and the MI5 thought that he would be a danger to the free world. But uh, thank God they are second thoughts. Now, this is revealed in the book Defense of Realm, uh, of the Realm, written by Professor Christopher Andrew of the Cambridge University, published in 2009. He was commissioned to write a history of MI5 at the time of its centennial in 2009, I said. So it was set up in 1909. So that's a good idea, you know, to come out with a volume like that. Now the Intelligence Bureau in India was established in 1887. We don't know of anyone who thought of publishing its history in 1987. Now, to go back to Krishna Menon, <laughs> whether it was the 1954 repatriation of prisoners of war in Korea, or the 1954 Geneva Conference on Indochina, or the 1956 Suez Canal Crisis, uh, India spoke and the world listened. What India spoke made a difference to the course of geopolitics. India was not even invited to the 
1954 Geneva Conference on Indochina. But Nehru sent Krishna Menon. He had 200 meetings in three weeks, each meeting lasting on an average two hours. So you can figure out whether Krishna Menon slept or not. He was a workaholic. Now, the beauty is that the final outcome of the Geneva Conference was drafted by Krishna Menon, and it was more or less the same as the points made in Prime Minister Nehru's address to the Indian Parliament several weeks earlier. Now, why did the world listen to India? We can discuss it. There's more than one reason. Now, let's go back to the Charter of the United Nations. Uh, chapter six, there are articles dealing with uh, obligations of parties to a dispute, investigation of disputes and fact-finding and so on. <clears throat> now, the Charter is almost perfect. So are many of the constitutions in the world. But the policemen of Roosevelt are often the lawbreakers. So the question is, who will police the police? So it's not enough to have good documents. We have to be true to the document. We have uh, a debate on the United Nations at 75 at the India International Center next week, next month. Now let us attempt a balance sheet of the United Nations at 75. One, prevention of war. Well, I would give three out of 10. Ending a war if it has started, four out of 10. Well, one of the wars that ended, the major war, was the Iran-Iraq war in the 80s. The Security Council resolution requiring ceasefire, ceasefire was accepted by Iran on 20th of July, 1988. But let's understand the background. On 3rd July, United States Navy shot down Iranian civilian flight, killing 290, 290. And there was not much of a world sympathy for Iran. Iran realized that it could not carry on. And the Ayatollah Khomeini was told by his advisors that Iran would require a military budget eight times bigger than what it had. And that the war would last, could last till 1993. So the Ayatollah declared, happy are those who have departed through martyrdom Happy are those who have lost their lives in this convoy of light. And happy am I that I still survive and have to drink the poisoned chalice. In short, the UN provided a convenient instrument. One party, that is Iran, was thoroughly exhausted. Now we can speak of proper conflict resolution only when both parties want to end the war and seek peace, even when they are not exhausted. Third item, peacekeeping. Well, here the United Nations have been doing much better. We can give it seven out of 10. We don't have to go into the details in how many countries and how many soldiers and all that, but we know that. Next is post ceasefire political reconstruction. Well, one of the best success stories is in East Timor. Uh, I don't know whether I have sent you the photograph, but uh, let me give you the timeline. Portuguese invaded Timor in the 1600s because it was a source of sandalwood. In 1749, Timor was split between the Portuguese and the Dutch. Of course, in 42, the Japanese came. Then what happened is that, you know, uh, there was a nation relations conference in Delhi and the Netherlands had to withdraw. Sukarno was a leader 
of uh, Indonesia. In 1974, Portugal decided to withdraw from Timor. Well, there was much confusion when they started to withdraw. There was a civil war um, and uh, Indonesian forces came. 200,000 people were killed, a quarter of the population in the fighting and the famine and the disease that follow such invasion and fighting. Then in 1999, there was a change of leadership in Indonesia and East Timorese were allowed to vote in an independent uh, independence ballot. So that UN arranged 78% wanted independence. Then the United Nations took over the administration and prepared the territory for independence. And in 2002, East Timor became independent. So that was a splendid story of the UN doing a very good work. Now coming to Jammu and Kashmir, has it worked? In a manner of speaking, it is still hanging fire in the sense that uh, Pakistan raises it uh, at uh, um, organization, OIC, and also at the United Nations. I don't want to go into the background because we don't have time, but uh, very briefly, the United Nations resolution had provided for a plebiscite in Jammu and Kashmir, but uh, before that, Pakistan had to withdraw all its forces. India had to withdraw most of its forces, but keeping a certain amount for keeping law and order. And then there was to be an administrator who was to arrange for the plebiscite. Pakistan never withdrew its forces. So the condition was not uh, satisfied. But in between came the United States because in 1953, the prime ministers of India and Pakistan met and it was decided that they would look for a plebiscite administrator. But then came John Foster Dulles. Well, in my generation, we used to say Dal, Dalar, Dulles because uh, in 53, the Soviet Union exploded an atomic, uh, uh, I'm sorry, hydrogen bomb. And Eisenhower was started wondering how much would it cost to intervene abroad. And he found out that it cost about $3,515 a year to keep a US soldier abroad. But uh, if it's a Pakistani, it'll be only 4,408. Much cheaper, eh? So the US started arming Pakistan and then Nehru decided it did not make any sense to, going, uh, to go on with the move for a plebiscite. Now, I want to say a word about truth commissions. <laughs> uh, you heard about it. Uh, Well, they have been there mostly in Latin America, but also in Uganda. Um, there was a one, famous one uh, in, uh, in uh, South Africa. Uh, there was one in Guatemala, which was called Historical Certification Commission. Uh, the one in Argentina was called National Commission on the Disappearance of Persons. There was one in Sri Lanka appointed by the president which has subpoena powers. In the case of South Africa, the commission could give you amnesty if you told the truth. And uh, more recently in Tunisia, uh, there was uh, a truth and reconciliation commission, but I can tell you that uh, the government of the day decided to do its utmost to prevent the commission from doing its work. They couldn't get documents, they couldn't get money for having a proper offices. In any case, whatever they came out with was ignored. So this is what I call it palasam. I-T-P-A-L-P-A-I-A-S-M. It pasam. Sorry, it pasam. That is inability to pay attention in a sustained manner. Now. 
Uh, I want to raise a question. Repentance. How many people believe in repentance? That is, I have done something wrong. I should beg absolution for it. I am at fault. I, my experience, very few people believe in repentance. During the civil services interview, uh, I had asked, uh, you know, some years ago, I had asked one of the candidates who had done an LLM. So I said, imagine the thought experiment. One of your best friends comes to you at one o'clock at night and tells you that he wanted to hide a pistol that he had used to kill somebody. And he had another request that you should hide him also in the bathroom so that nobody will know where he is. So I said, uh, would you do that? So the candidate hesitated. He did not give an answer. Then I pursued it. I said, would you defend uh, the murderer? And he said, of course, sir, because every human being is entitled to defend. Well, I pursued the matter, but I could see that there was no moral outreach, you know? That is what is lacking in the world, moral outreach. Now, how much of money are we spending for war making capability? 1,917 billion. That is a calculation by CIPRI, Stockholm. Now that is, the global population is 7.7 .7 billion. Yeah, I'm giving you the 2019 figure. So per capita, it comes to $248. <coughs> now the UN has um, a section for peacekeeping, conflict prevention, all that comes under the political affairs. Now they don't get much money. In fact, a good part of what they do, their funding is from voluntary contribution, you know, which you never know when it will come or whether it will come. So why? Is not peace and prevention of conflict not important? Now the UN budget itself is uh, a little over 3 billion. So per capita, it comes to 38.9 cents. Another question. But before that, uh, I, okay. Peace studies in universities. Well, some universities have it, but uh, how many have it? Now, I want to ask a question about the qualities of media mediators. Is there a science there? No. It's the question of judgment. It's an art. Good psych psychology is a good asset. Deep understanding of the culture of the parties in dispute is important. Honesty and character. I am emphasizing this because very recently, a diplomat called Bernadine, he was the special representative of the Secretary General in Yemen. And uh, he started passing on information to United Arab Emirates, Emirates. And then, you know, he resigned and took up a job at the UAE of all institutions, diplomatic academy as the director general. Well, even the best of diplomats can make a mistake. Kofi Annan, he convened a conference on Syria without any Syrian present, other powers in interfering uh, in Syria were present. And of course, he was in touch with, uh, uh, well, President Assad and some other Syrians, but no Syrian was present at the conference. The conference came out with the recommendations and then 
Kofi Annan wondered why the recommendations were not acted upon. Can you imagine a conference to decide on what should we do in Syria without any Syrian present? Okay, now I'm going to conclude, but before that, uh, I want to ask a question. What exactly is the United Nations? Well, let me put it this way. To my mind, it has got three parts. One is the Security Council and the General Assembly. Now, the Security Council is a part that has been rather inefficient and ineffective. The second part is ECOSOC, Economic and Social Council, WHO, <clears throat> FAO, UNICEF, UNESCO, and all that. Now, they are doing a lot of good work. And the third part is the Secretary General and the Secretariat. Now, this third part also is doing a lot of good work. The Secretary General's uh, special representatives, they try to um, uh, resolve conflicts in Yemen, in Syria, uh, in Libya, and in many other places. They don't always succeed, but that's not their fault. You know, you can only take the horse to the stream, make it drink. So, unless the parties to the dispute want to arrive at a settlement, unless they are prepared to, you know, do give and take, and unless they are convinced that the only thing that matters is not their saving face, but a settlement, because human beings are suffering. That is the most important fact. So unless there is a readiness, you cannot have a you know, settlement. But we call ourselves what? Homo sapiens, sapiens. Twice, eh? sapiens, twice. Why? I don't know. Uh, it passes my understanding. So let me stop here and uh, you are most welcome. I'm sorry I should have told you that you could have interrupted me at any time because what I really wanted was to have a conversation with you, not to give a lecture. Now let me learn from you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, now we open the floor for questions and answers or comments, of course. Um, so anybody? Did any question or comment? Desnath, uh, can I go? Yes, yes please. So thank you so much. It was an overwhelming presentation, in fact, with so much of facts and figures. Uh, my question is this, in all the negotiations that we see, why are people only looking at some kind of uh, manipulation? I mean, it's like somewhere it's always about me winning and the other losing. Why is the heart not coming into place? I mean, are our middlemen not trained in that way? Thank you. May I answer? Yes, please. Thank you. A very, very interesting and a very crucial question. As I was saying, you know, in many cases, people want to save face. They don't want to be seen as having, you know, yielded in any way. They want to have ultimate triumph. In other words, they are, cannot think as human beings. They think of themselves as, you know, the leader of a particular political party or the leader of a country or the leader of a faction. You know, they cannot think as human beings. Another thing is that uh, uh, there's a lot of false pride. 
most people think, you know, by yielding, they are diminishing themselves. No, that's not true. In fact, you know, by giving, you know, you are getting, you are getting peace, you are getting a better world, you know. So that has to be realized. And uh, let me give you one example. Mahatma Gandhi, in 1947, there was a big divide between the uh, Muslim League uh, and the Indian National Congress. Gandhi went and told uh, Mountbatten, ask Jinnah to be the prime minister. Let him. Well, Mountbatten, of course, the clever Mountbatten, he naturally, and he's right, he consulted Nehru and Patel and maybe others, and they told him, no, no, don't take Gandhi seriously. And it was not done. But Gandhi had made sense because let Jinnah have the responsibility and then we will see. You know, that sort of fearlessness, you know, that is seldom there, you know. Recent, uh, uh, in our times, uh, it's very difficult to see um, any instance of, uh, you know, people settling a big issue by give and take. Sometimes they pretend, say, in Yemen, for example, in 2012, Saleh retired, you know. But then after that, you know, he joined the civil war because he wanted his son uh, to, you know, have a political career. So people have ambition either for themselves or, their, or for their uh, uh, children or for their best friends. So this sort of reckless ambition, which can, I, I would call it blind ambition, you know? Or even look at uh, President Trump. He <laughs> asked his followers to go and raid the Congress, I mean, the Capitol. Can you imagine? Could he think well? Should he not have known that uh, he can't get away with it? But somehow he thought. That is one thing. Secondly, the number of people who can be brainwashed is enormous, you know? So we should now find out, you know, the brainwashability index <laughs> of different populations. Have I answered your question? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Right. Anybody else? Hi, Bezat. Can I can I ask the question? Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Please go ahead. Yeah, sir, uh, this is Sabiha Mure, and I'm a teacher, educator, associate professor in a college. Um, I don't know. I have been teaching um, political history, social history, and normally history and other allied subjects in which I have understood one thing that diplomacy is the art with which powerful nation survive. Basically, if you look at the whole agenda of diplomacy, you know, like whether it is it is uh, Tony Blair going to a tent uh, in Libya and meet Colonel Gaddafi, who's a despot, and say everything is fit and fine, or whether it is, uh, you know, Donald Trump getting upset and calling COVID-19 a Chinese flu and withdrawing from the WHO funding or whether it is, it is uh, you know, like uh, General Nasser, you know, in Egypt, having a very wonderful relationship with uh, the other despot. In fact, it has been accused that all these Arab despots were, were together to make, and UN did not do enough, or United Nations did not do enough to stop what Arab world is facing right now. Um, in Syria, Libya, Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco, everything. You know. So my question is, why is the United Nations diplomacy at its weakest, if you look at the world scenario today, especially, quote unquote, in the pandemic situation, that uh, United Nations is not talking about China and it's, I'm not saying it is one who perpetrated the crime, but 
he did not inform china did not inform the world advance enough uh, to save a lot of lives you know so why is it that united nation has been accused of manhandling the pandemic what went wrong in diplomacy this is what my question is thank you thank you sabiha uh, it's not the easiest of questions but thank you <laughs> but you started with uh, tony blair he wrote uh, a book about his own life and uh, i had reviewed it for the front line okay and i had i had called him tory blair not tony blair but tory blair in fact uh, you know that uh, military coup in egypt uh, in 2013 july when morsi was toppled in fact he was kidnapped by the military now tony blair had a part to play in it and uh, you will hear more about it in my book which is coming out because uh, there are recordings uh, audio recordings where somebody says uh, oh we can expect that money from the uae tomorrow and uh, uh, tony blair also is uh, uh, coming to cairo along with the uae delegation and all that so he has played a, an exceptionally reactionary role strange for a labor party anyway <clears throat> now regarding trump the less said the better <laughs> but your question is what has the united nations done and the second part is what is um, you know happening to diplomacy now coming to the second part first classical diplomacy is almost gone because now what is happening is that people make statements to the media the idea of two individuals representing two sovereign nations sitting together and discussing things calmly without telling the whole world what they are do they are going to tell each other it hardly happens you know look at who you said about trump well trump's case was a study in uh, you know uh, uh, study in uh, miserable diplomacy because he announced as you said you know we won't uh, we will we would stop funding the who you are getting out of who and all that now what he should have done is that when the who assembly world assembly health assembly met he should have talked to his diplomat should have talked to other delegations and said listen let's see what let's look at what has happened in early december there were instances of pneumonia in uh, china in wuhan hmm? and then 30th uh, of december a young doctor dr li uh he went on the social media expressed uh, his disquiet over instances of pneumonia and then the mayor of wuhan rebuked him and silenced him okay now why did the mayor do that the mayor did it because he had plans for a big do to celebrate some party congress and uh, the big do was to uh, end with uh, a big banquet humongous bang banquet for 40000 families families 40000 so the mayor did not want anything to interfere with it so he went ahead with the banquet the virus went viral and then xi jinping woke up he must have known that uh, uh, what was happening of pneumonia he must have known that the mayor was planning this big do but he didn't stop him then xi jinping xi jinping sent a very senior epidemiologist he was 83 years old to wuhan he investigated and i think on the 22nd he went on national radio or television saying that listen there is an epidemic and the lockdown was imposed on wuhan 
and a little later or at the same time, Hubei province, about 50 million people, eh? 22nd or 23rd early morning, two, two, two o'clock or something like that. Then what happened? The WHO, the emergency committee met on the 22nd. Remember, WHO has a mission uh, in uh, Beijing. Eh? <laughs> they can also see the uh, national television. Anyway, <clears throat> they met and uh, the question was they, whether they should declare uh, a they should declare a public health emergency <coughs> of international importance. For two days, they debated. They couldn't decide. And then you know what they decided? We shall meet in another 10 days time. What does it mean? The virus will wait for this emergency committee to relax and meet again? Well, the director general had second thoughts. I think he went to Beijing probably on the 24th or 25th. He met Xi Jinping. He came back and then he summoned the emergency committee. And I think by 30th Jan, they declared an emergency. You see? And then when do they declare an epidemic? I'm sorry, pandemic? 11th of March, if I remember right. But by the time 4,068 human beings had died, 118,000 infections. Now, where is it written in the WHO rule book that you have to wait for 4,000 human beings to die before you declare a pandemic? So WHO has failed. But the pity is that when the World Health Assembly met, nothing was done to point out these things China managed the diplomacy much better. They announced uh, amount, uh, lots of amounts for Latin America, for Africa, and uh, they sort of uh, watered down the uh, draft which Australia had given. So let me put it this way. A, classical diplomacy is not, not at all in fashion. B, those who are in charge, they are either forgotten or they don't know how to do it. But with Biden, I expect, uh, you know, return to dignity, civility, and a little more of classical diplomacy. Any point which I missed out? No, sir. Thank you very much. Actually, um, the chronology that you gave to us makes more sense that diplomacy wasn't good enough uh, in this case of uh, handling the pandemic. And those people who raise an eyebrow saying that, uh, Dr. Antonio Gutierrez has failed, uh, have good enough reason to believe so because really they did not work in the right time, in the right manner, at the right spot. They failed and they failed miserably, if I'm allowed to say. Of course, UN is a very great uh, institution. It has done milestone works. It has done some real lovely work, but off late, its uh, credibility is at stake. You know, I don't know why it happened. Uh, poor countries like us, middle class families like us, uh, have to thank, uh, you know, UN and its wings uh, to make a lot of difference in our lives. I'm not uh, denying the fact, but of late, they have been suspicious of uh, handling things under the pressure of so-called power makers or power challengers, whosoever we call. Uh, thank you so much, sir. It thank was you. I just want to make two more points before the next question. Yeah. One is that uh, there's a lot of money involved. Yes, in fact, it is. Uh, there was, uh, uh, China had supported the election of the director general of WHO. So no, I read somewhere, the, it has given $45 million to WHO somewhere. I don't no, know. That is to WHO. That, no, that is a, 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 um, about the board payment. Yes, but yes. Otherwise, China had used its diplomatic clout uh, to get uh, the director general elected. Oh, okay. And then it makes voluntary contributions, you know. Okay. And uh, uh, another thing is that, you know, the Security Council decided to impose sanctions on Iraq. Remember? Yes, yes sir. Yes. Sir. After 1990, when Saddam Hussein foolishly thought he could do have, have a picnic in Kuwait. Now, those sanctions were actually genocidal in the sense that people were dying. 
Okay. Now that is one part of the UN. But the other part of the UN, the th uh, second part which I mentioned, w uh, WHO, FAO, uh, uh, World Food Program, they were doing a lot of work in Iraq to prevent starvation, to provide health care, to provide good drinking water. I just want to share a story with you. I went to Kuwait uh, um, after, uh, sorry, to Iraq after the liberation of uh, Kuwait. And uh, at that time, the sanctions were on. Uh, this was before 2003. And uh, I attended a, a cocktails reception. A young lady walked up to me and uh, uh, wanted to talk. And uh, she was from Germany. And uh, she said that uh, she had just come from somewhere outside uh, Baghdad. Uh, so what were you doing there? Oh, I had to go and check on uh, whether uh, 25 uh, syringes which had gone to that particular place, whether they were being used correctly for the purpose for which they were meant, you know, you know, the sanctions requirement. Okay. <laughs> so I raised my glass to her health. And then she said, but you know, Ambassador, I feel bad. Why? You know, I got $100 for making that trip. And that money comes from Iraq's oil export. And I feel bad because these people are so poor. And she was so right because I knew then that the school teacher was getting about five or maximum $10 a month. And eh, because they didn't have the money. And then this is very interesting. I was staying with our ambassador and there was a Iraqi cook or chef. I wanted to tip him, giving some, some dollars. The fellow will not take it because it was a question of his honor. I literally had to beg him to take it. For my sake, please take it. And he took it. And that was, of course, a little more than the monthly salary of a teacher. Can you imagine? Terrible. Abul Kalam Azad. Uh, hello, sir. Good evening. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, I am Abul Kalam Azad. I am from Dhaka, Bangladesh. Uh, sir, it is very nice to listen to your exciting history of diplomatic, uh, diplomatic life. Uh, sir, as you are, a, uh, as you are a, a former ambassador and you work as diplomacy in many countries, my question would be, as you are mentioning regarding United Nations, so, I mean, uh, my question would be regarding United Nations dialogue policy or their sanction or their overall system. Let's say, I mean, in some cases, this is my personal view. I mean, the United Nations is just pursuing the permanent members, uh, let's say the Russia, France, uh, that I, I don't know to mention the name of I mean, other country, just pursuing their own interest. Let's say uh, United Nations is, uh, I mean, just uh, mm, doing some resolution against some countries, let's say against Israel. They have many resolution against Israel, but no, can, no country have, I mean, have, I mean, there is no proper action against Israel. I mean, but although Israel, I mean, United Nations has passed so many resolution against this. But on the other hand, let's say just as you are mentioning about Iraq, Iraq in uh, in 2000 uh, in 2003, when they passed resolution, immediately whenever it saw that you you I mean USA it is going for their interest and the um, I mean they attacked Iraq and they had been killed as you know and everything. Now the history is over here. So the case is, I mean, it's just I also in case of Myanmar also I, we can say, uh, just uh, a, for the Rohingya people they have passed a resolution against I mean some of some of the country also because USA didn't want uh, to um, pass the resolution although it isn't passed but in active in practically there is no I mean efficiency or there is nothing being happening after the first resolution is being passed. But so my my question is actually I mean from your point of view maybe my question would be a bit. I mean, full. Uh, is there any United Nation? I mean, has any actual power that by whom they can do anything to the world? Isn't it? Are they the power of the five Security Council member only? That's my question, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Assad. Uh, it's like this: uh, the United Nations, as I said earlier, is not an independent agency. 
it is only providing a forum. And it is the member states that have to act. It is the member states who alone can take decisions and use the UN forum to discuss matters and to implement decisions. But they are not doing it. Now, you mentioned about the Rohingyas. Yes, United States is not much interested, certainly not under Trump. But more than that, China came in the way of uh, any action uh, about the Rohingyas from the Security Council and Russia too. So that is the problem. That is the problem of veto. In other words, as I said earlier, the policemen of Roosevelt, they are the offenders. And when they are the offenders, nothing can be done. Incidentally, I said about veto. You see, uh, the Soviet Union uh, 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 wanted it because uh, it, uh, Stalin felt that uh, in the Security Council as well as in the General, Assem uh, GA, General Assembly, the United States will always have a majority. Okay, so that is why Soviet Union wanted the veto and it got it, you see. But the world has changed a lot. And the United Nations um, Security Council has to be reformed. But whether it will be reformed, that's a different question. It should be reformed. Whether it will be reformed uh, in the next five years, I doubt it because the P5, they do not want to change it. When they come to Delhi for some uh, consultations and all that, when they want to sell us weapons, then they will make out, they will come out with a statement. My country wants India to be a permanent member of the Security Council, but they don't really mean it. You see? So I'm afraid it will continue, but let us see, let us see. You should never, uh, uh, you know, sort of predict the future, but. Uh, uh, human nature being what it is, the P5 does not want to change at all. So while United Nations is a very, you know, if uh, as somebody put it, you know, if it was not there, we should have invented one, you know, it's very much necessary, but uh, it has some structural weaknesses which need attention. All right, anybody else? Yes, hello. Uh, hello, sir. Thank you for this enlightening, enlightening presentation. Sir, since we are talking about the failure of diplomacy or as you have mentioned, the failure of classical diplomacy nowadays. So I have a question related to the contemporary issues like unblockade of Qatar by its Arab neighbors. What was the reason that which led to the unblockade of Qatar? Is it successful or success of diplomacy or something else? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Now, I think we have to get our, uh, uh, what shall I say, uh, use of words correct. It is not a failure of diplomacy. It's a failure on the part of those who are responsible to make use of diplomacy. Okay. Because, you know, diplomacy is not, uh, uh, you know, is a means, it's an instrument which human beings can use if they want. If they don't use it properly, then it is not diplomacy's fault. It is a fault of the human beings, of the individuals, or of the states, or of the institutions. But basically, you know, it is a fault of the individuals. Because even in institutions, what is an institution? It consists of those indiv individuals who are in charge. So the basic element is the individual. You see? So we are now living in a time where resort to diplomacy is very seldom. Okay, now coming to Qatar, I have written extensively about it. Um, I was ambassador in Qatar. Now, most scholars, Americans and others will say that, you know, listen, uh, between uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, 
there is a history of tension, they have a border dispute. So we have to see what happened in that context. They are right and they are wrong because it is my view that the blockade of Qatar, which happened in June 2017, I think, 5th of June, <clears throat> would not have happened but for President Donald Trump who decided to make his first official visit to Saudi Arabia, a departure from his predecessors who always made it a point to go to Mexico neighbor or Canada, another neighbor, or sometimes Europe. But Trump chose Saudi Arabia, why? Because there was a special relationship between Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner and MBS the crown prince. You see, there was, he was not a crown prince then, he was a defense minister and uh, Merkel was supposed to come and meet uh, with Trump. Then there was uh, some storm or something like that and Merkel's uh, flight got delayed and uh, uh, MBS was in town in touch with Jared Kushner. So the, Kushner was able to arrange for a lunch with the president. Lunch, you know, earlier the plan was to have lunch with Merkel, but that became, you know, that time became free and Kushner arranged a lunch with the president for MBS and, you know, they got along like a house on fire. While what did Trump want? He wanted to sell weapons. He is the most enthusiastic salesman for the military industrial complex. The military industrial complex about which Dwight Eisenhower had <coughs> warned his uh, compatriots way back in 1961 in his valedictory address, saying that, you know, this complex has grown in strength and we should do whatever we can to curtail its influence in decision-making. Well, America didn't listen to him. And later, the military industrial complex became military industrial congressional complex because, you know, congressmen and congresswomen got involved. They all, became, some of them became part of the complex. So what did Trump want? He wanted to sell weapons. So he went to Saudi Arabia in May, 20th of May, 2017. And there, Kushner was told by MBS of their plan to isolate Qatar. Kushner told Trump, but Kushner did not tell the Secretary of State, Rex uh, uh, Tillerson, you know, he didn't tell him. He was not uh, in the loop. Well, after that, after getting the note from Trump, they proceeded, Saudi Arabia and UAE. Uh, what they did was, as you know, they hacked the website of the Qatar News Agency and the agency carried a, a story that uh, the Amir had uh, criticized uh, America praised Israel and Iran and all that sort of thing. Well, Qatar News Agency corrected themselves, but you know, by the time the story had spread and the newspapers uh, uh, in Saudi Arabia went on, you know, repeating the first story without saying that it has been corrected. Then of course, somebody arranged for uh, the email of the UAE ambassador in uh, Washington to be hacked. And uh, he was telling Washington, let us take the, uh, uh, the, the Pentagon air base out of Qatar and all that sort of thing. And then came the announcement on the 5th. It started early in the morning before six o'clock from Bahrain, then others chipped in. And they said that uh, Qatar was funding terrorism, absolute rubbish. Well, if terrorism means Muslim Brotherhood, you can say that, but then Muslim Brotherhood doesn't mean terrorism. Okay, but 
the main grouse was Al Jazeera. Now, the story behind Al Jazeera is it was started when I was uh, in Qatar. You see, BBC and Saudi Arabia came to an agreement to have a, an Arabic channel. And the understanding was that uh, Saudi Arabia will, uh, uh, will give the funding and BBC will have, uh, uh, will have uh, uh, complete editorial control. The channel started. Many BBC uh, journalists uh, resigned from BBC and joined this new company, new channel. And then Saudi Arabia said, no, sorry, we want to have some editorial say. BBC said no. So the whole thing fell through. And a good number of these uh, uh, BBC journalists, they were jobless. Qatar spotted an opportunity and they had the money and they started uh, Al Jazeera. Now, I was, uh, I visited Al Jazeera in December 2019. There was this conference, uh, Doha Forum. <clears throat> now, they told me that in June, when the blockade was announced, they were fearing that somebody will bomb their headquarters. They were so worried about it. In fact, there was a plan um, on the part of Saudi Arabia to carry out a military uh, uh, attack on Qatar, but Rex Tillerson stood in the way. He went on telling them, look, you can't do this. And also the Department of Defense. And that is one of the reasons why Tillerson was dismissed. Now, some people have praised Jared Kushner for uh, you know, the uh, removal of the blockade. Now, this is, uh, what shall I say, very, very sort of misreading of history. Because what happened is that uh, once uh, Jared Kushner came to know that Trump was not going to be reelected and that he will have to vacate the White House, Kushner wanted to do as much as he can because he knew, not only he, even MBS knew that once Biden comes, he will tell MBS politely, but firmly, listen, enough is enough. You better end that blockade of Qatar. So without waiting for that, they wanted to do it in a hurry. And that is what happened. But I am personally very glad because, you know, thousands of families always think of human beings. Don't always think of only states. Thousands of families were disunited you know, because of the consular uh, uh, boycott of Qatar. Husband and wife were separated. Children were separated. So it's a great thing that, uh, uh, that uh, they have removed the blockade. But I don't believe that, you know, everything is going to be hunky-dory hunky in the GCC. No, the problems remain, but uh, it's a good thing what has happened. It will, they have a long way to go before it becomes a harmonious... Uh, working organization and uh, perhaps it may not happen because there are lots of factors involved what will happen with the jcpoa and all that did i answer the question please thank you very much sir actually sir my name is tausif i i, I would actually like to thank you uh, for bringing the facts of the qatar blockade actually uh, in fact, I've heard from a lot of people putting the facts, uh, figures, and the stories in a, in, a, in a wrong way. I would, in fact, uh, would love to interact with you and write an edit, uh, a complete copy of actually uh, the, the exact facts that you actually put it down and the series of how it uh, happened. Because there is, there is a different notion towards people telling that this blockade happened because Khatar did it, but it's actually not which people need to understand the, the real facts of what and how it happened. So, uh, uh, Behzad, I would like to uh, get Sir's uh, details so that I would like to write the complete editor on this article and publish it in my uh, journalist. Thank you. I mean, I'll be glad to respond to you. Yeah, sure, sir. Sure. Uh, let's keep in touch. Are, where are you actually? Sir, I'm from Bangalore, sir, but I live in Qatar in Doha. I, 
Oh, you are in Doha. Okay. No, I'm not in Doha right now, sir. But I'm in huh? Bangalore. Ah, but what what were what are you doing in Doha? I mean, sir, where you are sir, there? I'm a blockchain expert. I I work for uh, I'm I work for an aggregator, logistics aggregator. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur there. Uh, I I'm also a BNI Great. member. Yeah. Well, yes, all the best. Yeah. All the best for your entrepreneur enterprise. Yes, I have met you a couple of times during the Kerala Forum uh, BNI meetings. Oh, okay, 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 okay. I mean, that was in December, twenty nineteen. Yes. Okay. Okay. Glad to meet you again. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I'm in touch with uh, the Doha engineers. I know, sir. I know, sir. Uh, I'm yeah. there in that group, actually. Oh, good, good, good. Give them my best greetings. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. All right. Um, uh, I have a question. Uh, yes, Nitya. Uh -huh. Okay, and then Okay. All yeah, right. uh, Thank you very much, sir. First of all, for your profound wisdom uh, out of your experiences, sir. I have two questions. First is that how do you understand the position of women in the entire project of diplomacy? Because that has been a perennial absence, as if it's a domain of man's world, and all we get to see are, uh, you know, the leaders personified as men. So how do you understand out of your own experience? Is there a neglect? Is there that in itself is an oppression somewhere? Or what could be the role of women? on the political sphere. And sir, secondly, you talked about the nature of human psyche understanding. And uh, these days, sir, I've been engaging a lot with political psychoanalysts and uh, they talk about really delving deeper into the psyche of humanity, not as an inherent uh, character, but something which is socially manifested. So, sir, I just want to uh, sort of take this opportunity to ask you that, what sort of engagements happen at a level of diplomacy? Is it more uh, pragmatic or is there a bent of philosophy also there? And who, according to you, are the philosophers we can turn back to who are really relevant? Because out of your experience, I'm sure uh, you, know, you would know that better that any political thinker or philosopher who's really central to the present contemporary understanding, whose ideals maybe we need to revive better so if you would just like to shed some light on that thank you sir thank you Nitya. Uh, where are you are you in delhi or uh... sir i'm in delhi yes i'm a student of jnu and JNU. Right now okay. I'm teaching in delhi university okay. yes thank okay. you good now first question first i have come across brilliant lady diplomats they are in no way, in fact, in many cases, they are superior to their uh, men counterparts. Now, as to why we have uh, less uh, lady diplomats, but let me also tell you, uh, I had once uh, addressed, uh, uh, I think it was in Canada um, in the 80s, uh, the, those who have joined uh, foreign service. And also in Finland, I had done that in the 80s. And uh, there were so many girls. And the director told me, now, can you tell me, tell us how to get more boys to write for the exams? You know? So in some countries, the trend is, more and more uh, uh, women are joining diplomacy, okay? And I'm sure that happy trend will spread. Even uh, in India now, I, when I come across the civil service, uh, you know, there's a growing number of girls who come in and they, in general, they are more serious. They take uh, their project more seriously. Now, coming to the other question, uh, you were, uh, your question was about, uh, um, you know, human nature and psychology. Well, let me put it this way. I find a, mis uh, a distressing lack of uh, 
historical awareness among those who are in charge of policy. Let me give you one example. I can easily give you an example from Trump, who said that uh, the Kurds, oh, they didn't help us at Normandy, Second World War. Can you imagine? President Trump is saying, you know, he abandoned them. He made use of them in the fight against the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, okay? Because it was the YPG, the YPG, the uh, People's Protection Forces of the Kurds. There are lots of women soldiers there. Eh? It is they who provided the ground, the boots on the ground. You know, America was only sort of bombing from the sky and most of the other countries also. I mean, uh, European powers. It was the Kurds who provided the ground of forces, okay? And uh, don't know about probably, you know, a large number of them died. Figures are there, but you know, uh, reliable figures are difficult. Thousands of them died, okay? Then he abandoned them, you see, for his own reasons. But uh, his statement about, you know, they had not, but again, he was wrong because the Kurds had taken part in the Second World War. They were not at Nor Normandy. That's a different matter. But they had taken part. Now, let me give you another example of another president who is uh, celebrated in the United States, Truman. You see, he succeeded uh, Roosevelt. Okay? Now, Nehru became uh, vice president of the Viceroy's Council in 1947, much before 15th of August. Okay. And the previous year, we had bad rains in India. And there was good reason to believe that there might be a famine shortage of grain, wheat and rice. So Ramaswamy Mudaliyar, he led a team from India to the United States asking for food grains. Because during the Second World War, there was a control board consisting of United States, United Kingdom, and Canada. They controlled the movement of food grains. Okay. Now, Mudaliar wanted a meeting with uh, Truman. He refused. And lots of Americans, they wrote publicly to Truman, no, you have to see. Well, you know what Truman said? Listen, the food grains that we have, that is meant for the allies, not for others. Now, can you imagine President Truman not knowing that India was, how many thousands of Indians died in the Second World War? Certainly more than, certainly more than Americans. Now, he didn't know that. And he said, no. Anyway, he was uh, corrected. And he met the delegation, but we were not, we didn't get much. You know, so ignorance of history is there, but apart from ignorance of history, the, the, the realization that we are all human beings, you know, and that we are all fellow travelers in this small boat called Earth in the immensity of space. And something can happen to it. And in fact, something is happening to it, the environment, you know, which uh, does not require a visa from anyone. The damage to the environment, pollution, disease. Okay, so that feeling is not there, you know, that Vasudevaika Kudumbagam, as we say in India, the whole world is one family. That feeling is not there. It's always, you know, me, me. Well, when Trump says America first, he actually means Donald Trump first. You see, so, you know, it's a question of character. You know, you may, uh, you may have, even our uh, uh, diction, we say it's a prerogative of the prime minister to decide on such matters. 
Why don't we use plain English and say that it is the responsibility of the prime minister to take decisions? I bring in the word prerogative. You know, so we are not democratic in our mindset. So we need a revolution. A revolution of the mindset. And as you know, war begins in the mind of man. So peace also can begin only in the mind of man. Well, when I said man, it in good woman too. It's the human mind. Did I answer? Yes, sir, you did. Just another thing that who, which thinker of we really need oh, to turn okay, okay, back okay, to in okay, order to, yeah. okay, and now, one or two, your. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. That, yeah, sure, sure. One is Immanuel Kant, who wrote, you know, Prologomena for Perpetual Peace. Now, let me tell you a story about this. I was in Canada when uh, Gorbachev came there. He was not, uh, you know, president or anything. He was just a member of the Politburo. Of course, everybody knew that he was, you know, coming up. So the press asked him <clears throat> as he landed, Oh, what were your thoughts? What were you doing just before landing? So he said two things. One is that I was looking at the Canadian planes. Well, you know, it is possible to conduct experiments about uh, <clears throat> flying, which can escape ra the radar. That was the time America was developing, a, you know, aircraft which can escape the radar. <laughs> and then he said, yeah, but most of the time I was reading Immanuel Kant on perpetual peace. You see, another thing is that uh, there is a wrong belief. Uh, uh, let me try to see, I can write to you later. Uh, there is a wrong belief. Uh, before the First World War, a European thinker came out with a book which was much acclaimed, saying that there cannot be a war because the countries in Europe are trading with each other so much. France and Germany, they are trading with each other. Germany and uh, United Kingdom, they are trading with each other. So they cannot have a war. You know, economic reasons for not having a war. But in short order, he was proved wrong. Now that belief, again, you know, some of us in India had believed that, you know, if we have a higher trade volume with China, then China won't attack us. It didn't make any sense. You see, war is there for other reasons, not because you don't have a, a high level of trade. And in fact, in the case of trade with China, we have completely messed it up. You see, it is so imbalanced. We are only now waking up. Thank God we have woken up. Purusa? Um, thank you very much, sir. It was it was very interesting to listen to you. Um, <laughs> so I had a question and a reflection. Uh, so my question is that, I mean, since you've had this opportunity to serve in um, major diplomatic positions in countries which are institutionally quite different from each other, like suppose Qatar is a monarchy and then there's Finland and Italy, essentially, you know, uh, constitutional democracies. Which political structure did you find was more amicable to international diplomacy? In a way, you found that diplomacy was really able to do something about things. So I just wanted to get an understanding from you about that. And then uh, there's another, I mean, it's a reflection is that, I mean, United Nations, just like any other liberal institutions, such as the League of Nations or any of the institutions that we had prior to that, whether they were just in Europe or elsewhere in the world. I mean, it, I think it, just like you said, I found it very pertinent that you use the word that it's just a forum. It's just a forum, so it means that there are people running it. I mean, it's not an independent agency on it. It does not have any independent agency of its own. It's being run by countries who are funding it, who are making sure, sure that it is there. So what I believe and how I see it is that, you know, UN is just a tool of these Western countries. It is their making. And once it stops serving the purposes, it ceases to exist. I mean, we have seen the... Uh, we have seen the US, we've seen the UK overriding United Nations as it pleases. Uh, just like, you know, uh, Sabiha mentioned about Gaddafi. 
so you know just like you also said that tony blair had a very huge hand to play in what happened in libya and at the same time there were also discussions around when that entire thing happened to gaddafi was that he was actually trying to do away with the dollar what he wanted was to bring back the gold dinar in africa and libya was one of the only countries only sub saharan african countries which was actually going to do something about its economy he wanted a new african union he did not want he wanted to detach oil trade from dollar so there was this entire geopolitics that was playing around what happened with gaddafi so essentially i mean i do not think that institutions like un can do anything because they want to do they will do it only when someone else wants them to do something else and once they stop serving that purpose it will also cease to exist yeah thank you very thank interesting you. questions uh, um first was about which uh, political system is uh, good for a diplomat to work in well i do not know whether i can generalize about the political system but let me tell you what i found i was in sri lanka as deputy high commissioner and i found the system they are most efficient in the sense that uh, suppose uh, we had from the high commission uh, suppose i had gone and met somebody at uh, 10:30 in the morning and given an aid memoir and suppose uh, at 12:30 there was a national day reception then you will meet uh, your colleagues from the sri lankan uh, foreign office now you can be sure that all the people you meet would have seen your aid memoir and you can have a discussion about it with, with any of them they were so open and you know without any internet or anything information passed you know what I mean. that is what i call efficiency the same efficiency i came across in vienna way back you know i'm talking about 6972 no internet nothing to the iaea i mean i had sent something or i had gone and met somebody and there was a national day reception at 12 o'clock 12 30 you can find uh, you know the uh, your senior iaea colleagues you can discuss it no no that was not always the case in other capitals it was not the case in italy you know and uh, i don't think it was the case in uh, uh, you know some other capitals too so that is there but in terms of sheer efficiency in a different way that is getting a decision uh Shine Shah's Iran was not bad. In the sense that you know, if you talk to the right person, you got uh, you you got a decision whether the decision was in your favor or not. But you got a decision. You know, you knew wh whom to contact. You know, so that was there. Uh, let me tell you, you know, the Iranians had imported some radioactive material from uh, Bombay. That is uh, the Baba Atomic Research Center, and uh, it had a half life. You know, if you don't clear it, you know, it will be of no use. Now, the customs people in Iran they didn't know what it was, and uh, they raised objections. Then the Iranian Atomic Energy got in touch with me, and said, "Kindly explain to our customs people that this is radioactive material for experimental purposes." So unless it is cleared soon, it will be of no use. I explained it on the phone, and it worked. You know what I mean. Even otherwise, I remember, you know, in Iran, when you go and meet a senior official, well, first of all, you know, uh, they had this habit. It's slightly embarrassing, but they had this habit of always giving you a gift, often a golden fountain pen. That was a gift. Now, well, I I couldn't have afforded giving back another <laughs> pen, so I used to carry some tea with with me, a packet of tea, Indian tea, which I should say that in Iran at that time was much appreciated. So, in terms of efficiency, a democracy may not be the most efficient. Instead, you know, when you want to get a decision, but uh, in terms of interaction, democracies are are better. You know, because uh, you meet them not only officially, 
but also unofficially at dinners and cocktails when the real work is done in a manner of speaking. You see, now coming to, you know, you said about Gaddafi and Libya and all that. I want to make a point. Action, the NATO action, military action against Gaddafi was taken mainly because of Sarkozy, the French president. Why? Because Sarkozy had taken money from Gaddafi for his 2007 presidential election. I'm saying it all is in my book uh, with much detail. In fact, uh, I've got a photocopy of a letter written by uh, Gaddafi to his uh, one of his aides, senior aides, in Arabic, uh, saying that, you know, very, what shall I say, uh, purple language, salutations to, and all that sort of thing. And then saying that, you know, please uh, make available an amount below 50 million euro to Sarkozy. You see? Now what happens? And then, of course, uh, Gaddafi came to Paris. He came with his tent <laughs> and all that. Now, why did Sarkozy do that? Difficult to know, but I think uh, psychology might help us. A great French philosopher, the La Roche Foucault, he said, for a minor favor, people like to thank the one who favored them. Even for a, you know, medium one, you know, people like to thank the other. But for a great favor, very seldom. In fact, ingratitude is returned. Now, Sarkozy knew that uh, Gaddafi had given him money. And in fact, there is a video, uh, it's, I mean, the link is in my book, uh, where Gaddafi's son saying that, how can Sarkozy do it? We made him president. And as you know, at this moment, Sarkozy is in serious trouble. Well, not only because of the money he got, there's another case where he tried to bribe a judge by saying him that he get him a, he'll get him a job somewhere. The judge was investigating his case. So, you know, finally it is coming to roost. And of course, he might have to pay for his sins. You see? But basically, as you said, you know, United Nations and all that, it only gives us a forum. It is for us, for the member states, to make use of the forum. But uh, the P5, in their different ways, are abusing the forum. Roosevelt's policemen are not policemen. They just have the uniform, but otherwise they are criminals. Only thing is that they commit a crime and get away with impunity because of veto. I forbid veto. Did I miss out anything? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, anybody else? Okay, so I think we don't have any more questions. Um, sir, do you want to add something at the end? Well, uh, I shall be glad to send my notes because, you know, as uh, one of the scholars said, you know, there are lots of facts and figures. So I shall be glad to send my notes and I believe I didn't send you one or two pictures. Oh. <laughs> I thought I had. <laughs> so that also I will send you. Sure. Okay. Okay. So okay. let us have, a, let's treat it as a beginning of a dialogue so that, you know, we are in touch with each other. Uh, hmm. And uh, through email, you know, we can ask questions and uh, share uh, our thoughts. Yes, and for I... me, it has, it has been a privilege to be with you. And uh, I wish you all the very best for 2021 and beyond. Thank you so much, Ambassador KP Fabian, for uh, joining us today. It was uh, really an honor listening to you.